This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Penny Bergamy. And we welcome you to a very special edition of the Georgia Fire Monitor as we have taken the show on the road this week. Destination, the world-renowned Georgia Aquarium in downtown Atlanta. Hi everybody, Ray D'Alessio along with my co-host, Kenny Bergamy. Today's show dedicated entirely to aquaculture and what better setting than this incredible facility, the Georgia Aquarium. That's right, Ray, it really is. The largest of its kind in the Western Hemisphere with more than 10 million gallons of water. Now coming up on the show, we'll take you behind the scenes and show you the life support system here at the Georgia Aquarium. Amazing to say the least, over 400 pumps totaling 5,000 horsepower. Also on today's show, now that Georgia's shrimping season is open for business, what can we expect this year? Recently, I made a trip to the coast in Brunswick and talked to a few experts who gave me their outlook on things. Plus, it's becoming more and more popular. Fresh, locally grown fish delivered from the pond right to your table. Mark Wildman profiles one Georgia man whose research is vital to making sure the fish you eat is of the highest quality. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. In 2001, as his way of thanking Georgia customers for their 20 years of support, Home Depot co-founder Bernard Marcus donated $250 million to help build what he hoped would be the world's best aquarium. Four years later, November 25th, 2005, his dream came to fruition when the Georgia Aquarium opened its doors for business. And the rest, as they say, is history. We are excited to say we have over 10 million gallons of water here at the aquarium, hundreds of species, hundreds of exhibits to see. Um, uh, namely, our most popular uh, exhibit is our Ocean Voyager exhibit with our whale sharks and our manta rays. Uh, we're the only aquarium in North America to have whale sharks and manta rays, so uh, coming here to see those animals is quite the treat. We also have our very own dolphin show, uh, live dolphin show. It's called AT&T Dolphin Tales, um, as well as uh, a number of other galleries to see our animals, including beluga whales, sea otters, river otters, and even albino alligators. Ocean Voyager um, in total is 6.3 million gallons of water. Uh, it's a lot, and the way we describe it is it's roughly the size of an American football field. If you build 30 foot walls around it and fill it up with water, that's what Ocean Voyager looks like. Uh, the tunnel that you walk through is about 15 feet or so underwater, and that acrylic there is actually made of acrylic and not glass. The acrylic is about 17 times stronger than uh, glass would be. Uh, so that acrylic is about uh, six to eight inches thick, uh, and, and it's a dome shape, so it's a little stronger. The big window in our OV theater, Ocean Voyager theater, uh, is about two feet thick, uh, and that's just because it's so large, it has to be that. But the neat part about the acrylic is that it provides zero magnification, so the animals are actual true to size. In Ocean Voyager, we have over 55 different species of animals, so uh, you're guaranteed to see a good number of those. Um, some of the highlights are sawtooth, our sawfish, um, our uh, whale sharks, of course, we have four of them. Uh, and our, our manta rays, definitely. You'll see a number of different stingrays uh, and uh, several species of our sharks, too. The whale sharks were actually transported here via UPS, um, and uh, UPS was actually a great partner with us. They actually donated their time and their airplane to ship uh, the four whale sharks to us from the coast of Taiwan. Uh, we had a great number of work that, a great number of uh, our team go into putting work together to make these shipping uh, containers for these whale sharks to come over. We took a lot of things into account, uh, life support, water, even the angle of descent and, and uh, ascent for the aircraft uh, to make sure these whale sharks stayed safe. So a whole team went over uh, to Asia to pick up these animals and brought them here via UPS. It took about 30 hours or so to get those animals here safely. Um, and then we escorted them down uh, the highway, so to speak, from the airport to the aquarium where they were brought into Ocean Voyager. And uh, these four will live out their lives here. Uh, we, we have Ocean Voyager designed for fully grown whale sharks. There's a lot of research that goes on with these, uh, these animals too. We're uh, one of the leading edges in research in terms of whale sharks. Not a whole lot's known about these guys. So 
We also go out to the ocean, um, in the Gulf particularly, and do a lot of whale shark tagging to check on them and see how they're doing, their migration patterns, feeding behaviors and things like that. There's a lot of stuff we still don't know and we're really learning a lot from these that we have here. I think over the course of the past 10 years, we've always exceeded even our own expectations and we've surprised ourselves with a lot of things that we've had, whether it's animals that are in our exhibits or um, just events that we create for our, our guests to visit. Um, I think we surprise ourselves sometimes even with that. And I think over the next uh, year or so, as we celebrate our 10 year anniversary, we do have some surprises uh, that are kind of kept under wraps for now and uh, up our sleeves, but we'll definitely let our friends and our, our guests know uh, as we go towards those times um, to be able to celebrate with us uh, and through our social media, through our website is all of those places that you definitely find that information when we're uh, getting ready to have a, a celebratory event. And by the way, discounts to the Georgia Aquarium, one of the many perks of being a Georgia Farm Bureau member. Best of all, annual membership dues, only $25, and membership is open to everyone. You don't need to be a farmer or have insurance with us to join Farm Bureau. For more information on other benefits or becoming a member, just log on to gfb.org and head on over to the membership section. All right, now coming up a bit later in the show, we're going to take you to a place that is pretty interesting. That is the pump room or the life support system, the heartbeat of the aquarium, so to speak. See what it takes to keep 10 million gallons of exhibit water clean, clear, and healthy for its inhabitants. Again, that's coming up in just a few minutes. Okay, meanwhile, staying with our aquatic theme for today's show, off the coast of Georgia, thriving in the pristine waters of the Atlantic, is the home of sweet, wild-caught shrimp. But imports have cut into the $13.5 million industry. Recently, I talked with one Georgia shrimper in Brunswick that told me it's hard work every June to January. There are fewer shrimp boats these days that set out from the Georgia ports, like Darien and Brunswick. One of the few remaining shrimpers along the coast, Frank Owens Jr., market manager and operator of City Market Seafood in Brunswick, told me every harvest season brings a number of challenges. Years ago, we had a pile of boats just here in Brunswick, you know, and the, between the imported market and, and you know, the Gulf, it kind of, it's kind of dwindled down. There's not very many of them left, you know. We have, there's probably 30 boats here in Brunswick. Owens keeps a pretty busy schedule between time at the retail location near historic downtown Brunswick and helping around the docks less than a mile away. These here are the, the, the big Georgia white shrimp, the rose shrimp. That's the, the female. And these are the, this one here is a, a big white shrimp that's a male and you, don't, you won't see the difference. The, the vein, the big row vein in that one and this one doesn't have it at all. <clears throat> and these are the small brown shrimp that we're starting to catch, that are starting to show up now. Next to the U.S. Coast Guard Station, heading to Jekyll Island on U.S. 17 is where you'll find Georgia's Coastal Resources Division of the Department of Natural Resources. Pat Gear is chief of marine fisheries and he helped set the start date of the shrimping season. Well, the season this year opened on June 16th. Um, by law, it can't open any earlier than May 15th. Uh, it will, it closes on the, the 31st of the year, unless of December, unless if we extend it. And typically we do extend the season into January most of the times. On average, uh, an average year, the season opens on June 6th and closes around January 15th. Gear admits it isn't always easy selecting the start of the harvest season based on water testing that they do in May. What we do is we have a survey that we do every month. We've been doing it since 1976. Uh, it's the longest time series for shrimp and blue crabs probably in the country at this point. And we sample from Savannah all the way down to the Florida line in the sounds, in the creeks, and offshore in the shrimping grounds to monitor shrimp and blue crabs. And we use that information to, you know, to manage the fishery and to open and close the season. Typically, our May survey, we go out and we look at water temperature, the size of the shrimp, the abundance of the shrimp, and how many of the shrimp, the percentage of the shrimp that are ready to spawn or already spawned. So when we see about 70% of the shrimp are ready to spawn, um, we know we can open the season soon. Both Frank Owens and Pat Gear agree there is nothing like the special taste of coastal shrimp from Georgia. And the next time you visit your local seafood restaurant or seafood market, you should ask if the shrimp they serve is wild Georgia shrimp. On the coast, yeah, we 
yeah, a lot of people come down here and they gonna take, they want to take them back, you know, and don't want these imported shrimp, you know. We just we try. I don't sell any imports at all. It is a better product. There's just no doubt in my mind. I mean, you know, uh, my daughter did a science fair project on it. You know, looking at imported shrimp versus local shrimp, and it's and the taste was superior. And it's like uh, once you've tasted, it, you'll know the difference. All right, much more from the Georgia Aquarium is still to come today, including a behind the scenes look at the massive pump system that's responsible for circulating all the water for the exhibits. It's a pretty neat story and it's coming up for you. Plus, we're also gonna head to Perry, Georgia to see how the Go Fish Educational Facility is not only educating the public on fishing, but also helping to keep Georgia water stocked with plenty of fish. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Georgia Farm Monitor. Is this little guy cute or what? I should say so. One of the many cool things to do here at the Georgia Aquarium, the sea otter encounter. This is where folks can learn about the otters themselves, their training, the food they eat and care, as well as the aquarium's programs to help sea otters at other facilities in the wild. All right, let's be honest, keeping 10 million gallons of water clean, clear, and healthy cannot be that easy, it right? It can't be. Here at the Georgia Aquarium, that difficult task lies on the shoulders of those who work in the Life Support Systems Department. The job they do is not only an important one, it's actually critical in helping to keep the animals alive at the aquarium. You can kind of simplify it and put life support as we take care of almost, if the aquarium was a body, we take care of the circulatory system. So we have all the pumps, which would be the heart of the aquarium. We have all the pipes, which would be the arteries and veins. Um, we take care of all the recovery systems, which kind of act like as the liver, kidneys. Um, so if a, a living body, we're, we're kind of we're spread throughout the entire aquarium and have a lot of responsibility to keep all of the exhibit water quality uh, where it should be within parameter. The ceiling in here is around 30, 35 feet. And you can see all the different layers of piping that go into this. And when they were building this room, they had to stop at the start at the very top of the ceiling and then work their way down to all these pieces of equipment within and as you can see they have to be within fractions of an inch to meet up with these equipment perfectly so there is a lot of automation in this room obviously 18 individuals working in life support can't take care of and try and move all these valves all the time but there's still a lot of responsibility and we have uh, what is usually dedicated as a watchstander that is responsible for responding to our computer control system we have a user interface over here on the wall and you can kind of go through and it it allows us quick response to the entire aquarium at any given point we have around we have over 20 23 computers on our system network that is separate from the the network within the, the aquarium itself and that is just for our controls for controlling ocean voyager our freshwater gallery our cold water quest galleries it includes belugas dolphins so at any given time, even from home, you would be able to access the control system from an iPad, uh, a laptop, or even a smartphone nowadays. Underneath our feet, we have two 250,000 gallon storage tanks and a couple 70,000 gallon mixing tanks. That's what these little manways are for. So this is how we mix salt. We have 72 horizontal sand filters. So each one of those, there's a pair of those that go to each one of these pumps. And they're responsible for moving anything over 20 microns and larger out of the water column in uh, Ocean Voyager system that we have the whale sharks and manta rays in. We have five wastewater recovery systems on, on site, and we have the capability of, of processing over 240 million gallons of water a day, which is larger than a lot of cities do. I believe I looked at a factoid a few years ago in the city of Boston, the city of Boston as a whole processes somewhere in the, the realm of 250 million gallons a day. So just in this building, we're able to process over 240 million gallons. You're not able to discharge the, the status quo of 10% of your water, water volume a day or a week, as in uh, a lot of the coastal aquariums are, are have to do. The Chattahoochee, which is our water source that we would have to discharge to, wouldn't take very kindly to all the salt water that we'd have to get rid of. So we came up with a plan when this building was under construction, and we have five wastewater treatment plants that uh, four of them that are dedicated to actual exhibits. So you have dolphin, beluga, uh, the whale shark and manta ray tank, which is Ocean Voyager, and penguin all have their own dedicated recovery systems. And then we have a multi-use system that takes a lot of the fish systems, sanitizes it, disinfects it, 
uh, cleans it up, polishes it, and then we're able to reuse it within the building to keep our uh, water conservation. All right, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archives of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching all those informative stories, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. We've set it up for you, so if you have a story idea, if you want to leave us a message or a comment or a suggestion, feel free to send us that message either on Facebook or at the address listed below. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Every year, thousands of Georgians pay a visit to the Go Fish Educational Center located in the heart of the state in Perry for a fun, interactive look at the fishing industry. Damon Jones gives you a behind-the-scenes look at this state-of-the-art facility that gives the visitors a little bit of everything. Wouldn't it be nice to have a fishing pond, outdoor aquarium, and interactive exhibits for your kids to enjoy right in your backyard? Well, that's the case for Central Georgians, as the Go Fish Educational Center in Perry has that and more. This four-year-old facility built by the Department of Natural Resources has quickly become a destination for fishing enthusiasts looking to get their kids into the sport. It's, it's kind of an easy way. You don't have to load up the boat and rods and tackle and go, especially with small children. Sometimes they don't have the patience to sit there for hours, uh, like those of us that have fished for a while. Uh, so it's, it's nice to come here and, you know, if the kid wants to fish for five minutes, they can have, find something else to do. And they should have no problem doing just that, as more than 20 different species of fish are on display in the outdoor aquarium to go along with games, movies, and simulators. It's an opportunity for children to not only have a good time, but also learn something about wildlife in the process. I think it was a big thought because that's, that's what we want, uh, is, is to educate people from the time they're small about conservation, about restoration, about um, using a resource properly. So we built from the beginning, um, had the idea that we were going to do field trips for, for school groups and we tailor all the field trips that we do here to great appropriate content that the state says they're supposed to learn for that grade. So between the fishing pond, the aquarium and the number of exhibits here on display, Plenty of hard work goes on behind the scenes to keep this place running smoothly. And most of it happens right behind me in this hatchery. Uh, we raise a wide variety of species actually. Uh, everything from walleye, sturgeon, uh, a little more cool water species to some largemouth, um, shad, trout for our pond, forage for the aquariums, kind of everything in between. So a lot of different species, uh, eight or nine different species on a given year are raised here at Go Fish. And many of them are being raised as part of a number of different projects for the Department of Natural Resources. For that reason, this hatchery is equipped with some of the most advanced technology. Uh, we do have a lot more filtration going on here because we have recirculating aquaculture versus pond aquaculture, which means our systems need to be able to uh, control ammonia and water, level, water quality issues as well as temperature, uh, remove solids, all those types of things. So we have a lot more technology in our build, building than most hatcheries. And it's that state-of-the-art technology that allows researchers to work on a number of different species from all over the country any time of year. It's a place for us to work with uh, these cool water species in a year-round environment. Uh, we have the ability to control water temperature here, being an indoor facility. We have heat exchangers where we can keep water cool. Uh, so even though it's really hot here in middle of Georgia, especially this time of year, we can still take care of these species right here uh, without having to worry about water temperature and some of those issues. So with all the hard work and high-tech equipment, Go Fish is sure to sustain a wide variety of species to look at for years to come. Reporting from Perry, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you so much. Now when we come back, we answer the question, how to stock a pond not accessible by vehicle? Here's your answer. Stay tuned. All right, we welcome you back as the Farm Monitor continues from the world-renowned Georgia Aquarium. Well, located just miles from the Tennessee and North Carolina state line, Bramlett Trout Farm produces on average around 500,000 eggs per year and supplies fresh fish to high-end restaurants in Atlanta, such as Bacchanalia, Atlanta Star Provisions, and Empire State South. In fact, Terry Bramlin himself delivers the fish every Wednesday, meaning the trout goes from pond to plate in as little as three hours. There is great reward in this. I've never tired 
of, of watching the enthusiasm that these fish have in the, in the feeding process when they're eating, the biological processes and uh, watching the eggs hatch, uh, nurturing those fish up to market size has always been a fascination for us. It's wonderful to be able to produce a quality product and market it in venues where it's really appreciated. Hey, check this out. Some incredible footage from high above the Uinta Mountains in Utah, which has more than 650 fishable lakes. However, access to those lakes nearly impossible by vehicle, so stocking them can sometimes be a challenge. Now, that's why a few times a year, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources uses airplanes to stock the lakes. Now, look at that. Hundreds of trout falling from the sky. This is something they've been doing for a long time. In fact, Utah started stocking these lakes with fixed wing aircraft all the way back to 1956. Now, yes, a very small percentage of the fish don't survive the fall, but the majority of them do. This time of the year, the DNR stocks the Utah lakes with tiger trout, rainbow trout, brook trout, and splake, and I want to go fishing. All right, Ray, back here in Georgia, aquaculture industry depends on research to make sure the producers stay profitable. Yeah, the monitor's Mark Wildman visited with one UGA Extension fishery specialist who works year-round to support and hopefully grow the Georgia fish industry. Here in Tifton, UGA Extension fishery specialist Gary Birdle is working to enhance fish production in Georgia. He looks over tanks of fish that are all a part of his research on catfish and other species of fish that are raised on farms around the state. The number one goal was to make sure producers keep their farms profitable. Our catfish industry really needs help finding a, a feed source that is affordable. The, uh, the recent prices of corn and soybeans caused our fish feed prices to go pretty high. And then our ener energy costs also caused the prices to go high. So it's what not as profitable to raise catfish as it used to be. A lot of ponds around Georgia are stocked with catfish, but research is underway to help producers grow other fish as well. And the bluegill sunfish could be a great alternative. We're trying to develop a technology that allows us to produce populations that are mostly males, because the male blue sunfish grows so much faster than the female sunfish. And so we're hoping to introduce some new technology there to help the interested fish farmers grow a uh, bigger fish and possibly use bluegill sunfish as a source of food. Another research project that would help producers centers around lowering the feed cost. This particular study is using black soldier fly larvae mixed with fibrous byproducts like wheat middlings to greatly lower the cost of feed. The research looks promising, but there is one big obstacle to overcome. The hard part is to get it, to get enough of the adult black soldier flies to produce these thousands of tons of larvae. Studies like this will continue in Tifton as the university works to keep fish populations high on farms across Georgia and encourage growth in the industry. Right now, we still have some uh, catfish farmers and some catfish processors, but most of our aquaculture money is made at fish hatcheries that sell catfish fingerlings or the bluegill and the largemouth bass, maybe even the grass carp to the recreational pond owner. So there's, there's a significant amount of money, probably eight to $10 million a year in fish that are sold through those hatcheries. Then we probably have another four to six million dollars in uh, catfish sales. But we have bait fish producers, we even have alligator producers that are significant economic additions to the state of Georgia. For the Georgia Farm Monitor, I'm Mark Wildman. Well, unfortunately, that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Fire Monitor. I wanted to thank everybody here at the Georgia Aquarium who made this possible. They've been over backwards for us. Thank you so much, guys. I really awesome appreciate it. Awesome time. Here's just a reminder now for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Hope you have a great week, everybody.